Uh, Tom, uh, there's a a magazine called Emerging Infectious Diseases, and you deal with that and have dealt with that uh, throughout your career uh, with the Rocky Mountain Laboratory. And uh, a new article uh, just online and is going to be published uh, in print uh, and coming out in February. But it all has to do with um, a, a thing called relapsing fever. Something that is is kind of rare in Montana, but has been, as they say, emerging. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Over the last 13, 14 years, we've been able to find evidence for this infection now in two regions of western Montana. First in uh, the Flathead Valley on Wild Horse Island in Flathead Lake during an outbreak in 2002. And we were able to get involved with that as soon as the first case was recognized by a physician in Seattle. And we were contacted and we got involved right off the bat and were able to go up there and find the ticks that transmit the bacterium that causes the disease and receive blood samples from the patients and isolate the bacterium and identify it. So that was um, rewarding for us because we've had a long career working on that tick-borne dis- uh, infection at the laboratory. So be able to be able to um, find evidence of it for the first time in Montana was satisfying. And uh, we've had an ongoing project up there because of that for several years. And then most recently, with the article you just mentioned, uh, a fellow living on the east side of the valley uh, outside Corvallis uh, got sick in 2013 and through uh, the working with the medical care, uh, medical care people here. Now the, uh, uh, he came into the hospital and he had a fever and said it, uh, you know, he'd been working near a wood pile. I think the first thing I would think about would be Hantavirus. And, right. And yeah. uh-huh. but, but they knew a little bit more. Well, okay. luckily, there is a very astute medical technologist at Marcus Daly named uh, Mr. Need, Chuck Need. He looked at the blood smear that he'd stained and he recognized the spirochetes in the blood. And uh, that uh, confirmed the infection in the individual and, and uh, what the individual had. And he was treated, but he had. Uh, severe complications and was transferred to um, St. Patrick's Hospital and was under the care of Dr. Joshua Christensen for five days. And uh, that's when we got involved. Uh, relapsing fever too, it, 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 it goes away and then comes back? Right. The bacterium has a, an elaborate genetic mechanism to alter its outer surface. So during the first wave of uh, acute illness, the, the bacteria are pretty much all the same. But then the antibodies that are produced to the infection clear the bacteria, but there's rare variants that don't look like the other bacteria that were cleared, and Mm -hmm. they can then repopulate the blood to a high level, and then the patient gets sick again. And then there's a new wave of antibody that's produced to that new population of bacteria, and most of them are killed off. The patient gets better, but then there's, again, a rare variant that's different that can cause a repopulation of the blood, and the patient gets sick again. Hence, the patient gets sick, gets better, gets sick, gets better. Uh, Now, this bug didn't evolve to make patients repeatedly sick. The bug evolved a way to persist in the bloodstream so it could be acquired by its fast-feeding tick vector that's in in nature that helps maintain the infection, infectious cycle between rodents and ticks. Wow. So it's it's all connected. It's all connected. Yeah. yeah. And and also there's a little bit, I don't want to use the wrong term, a little bit of mutation going on as far as the, the bacteria to, yeah, to the stay bacterium alive. Yeah, the bacterium has an elaborate mechanism to change genetically at particular places in its genome. So the antibodies miss it. Exactly. Sneaky little bugger. Yeah, they are. Yeah. <laughs> now this is from a tick that, um, uh, it's not from a wood tick, is it? No, it's a totally different type of tick that most people have never seen or will encounter. It's a little teeny one too, isn't it? It's tiny. uh, They they have uh, multiple stages that as the um, life cycle advances, the ticks get bigger, but uh, the first stage hatches out from an egg and that larval stage is only like a half millimeter across. Very tiny. That's the larva. That's the the larva. The larva hatches from the egg and it has six legs. Okay. Very tiny, but they can be infected by acquiring the infection from their female. And that larva can feed in just minutes and transmit the bacteria to a person if it's feeding on a person. Great guns. It's fast. It's very, they feed quick. Like the wood ticks you mentioned a moment ago, uh, most people have encountered them on the, in the valley, those ticks feed for many days. They they attach and feed for many days. But uh, these relapsing fever related ticks are nocturnal, come out at night, feed quickly, and then go back to where they came from. And when people wake up, they've never known they were bitten by this tick. And with that small meal, the tick can survive for years. Is that right? 
They can. They're amazing. These ticks uh, can live longer in the later stages. The larvae, if they don't feed, may die after four to six months. Uh, but the adults can live for years. And, Interesting. And so it's amazing. If you add all the stages in the life cycle, uh, these ticks can live for many years and outlive the, the vertebrate animals they feed upon. Is that normal for any other tick? It's normal for these soft ticks. The okay. Rocky Mountain wood tick that we have yeah. common here has a very strict two-year life cycle. So they're kind of short timers compared to these soft ticks no that, that can yeah. live for many, many more years. Yeah. yeah. When you got the call about the Corvallis incident, what, what do you do at that point? Yeah. So the, the, the call came from Dr. Joshua Christensen, um, who was um, taking care of the patient in Missoula. And he first wanted to have us identify what the bacterium was that was in the patient's blood. So we received the blood sample and then, then did what we do uh, routinely at the lab to uh, culture and purify the DNA and identify the bacterium. And we did that. At that point... We wanted to know what the travel history was of this patient because there's a fairly close what we call incubation period, which is the time that, in this case, a patient would have been bitten by the tick and infected, and when they come down with uh, obvious clinical symptoms and signs. It's a certain amount of time. Time. So I could be fed upon by infected tick today, but I wouldn't become sick for maybe five, six, seven days. So we looked at the history of the patient prior to his becoming ill, and he hadn't gone anywhere other than work in his woodpile in his backyard. And so then we sought permission from the patient to be able to um, do an, what we call an on-site investigation. And we went to the property, and lo and behold, we were able to find the ticks in the woodpile. And we brought those ticks into the lab, fed them on mice. They transmitted the bacterium. We isolated the bacterium. Uh, Sandy Stewart in our lab uh, did the DNA sequencing and found that the sequence for the bacterium from the patient was identical to the patient from the tick. And then uh, Bob Fisher and Brandy Williamson were able to get samples from chipmunks on the patient's property. One chipmunk was infected. We isolated the spirochete from the chipmunk. Sandy did the DNA sequencing, and it was identical to what was in the tick and in the patient. So we kind of nailed it. And that's the first reported incidence of that in the valley? Yes. What do you think will happen from this point on? Is it going to get um, um, larger incidents or, or what? 